Okay, so I, I work for Instana. Yeah. Yeah. I just pulled this on the, the website. So this is what we claim to be. Everybody makes claims. Uh, so a bit of background on who I am. Everything okay? Michael? Mike, uh, every, everything good? There. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. I don't have to go back, do I? <laughs> okay. So, um, Autoletics. Uh, that's, that's my history. My history is basically 19 years building application performance monitoring and management products. I, um, I'm really a researcher or scientist, a scientist in cybernetics, but every time I said cybernetics, people just stopped listening. So I didn't, it was very hard to get people to go beyond that. So at Instana, I think they call me a magician. They have another name for it, but that's basically the translation. <laughs> and what I deal with really is looking into the future, seeing where we are and where we're going, one, many of, one of many possibilities, and then figuring out where we are now and what steps we have to take to get to that future, assuming I'm correct in that assessment. And what I ma mainly focus on is software that tries to be intelligent, adaptive systems, cybernetics where we basically have feedback loops between systems. And I see that both in machine as well in the process and product. So I also see the products also have to be cybernetic. And I'll come to that how that works in the product. So my talk today will be, it's not going to be about uh, observability on Stana. There's many webinars online if you want to see that. There will be some uh, uh, screenshots of the product and I'll explain a bit about it. But it's really about why, what we're doing with observability, what it is. So hopefully this is going to be less, a little bit more entertaining um, uh, in that I'm not going to be just explaining this particular product. You hopefully you can walk away with this uh, understanding observability in, in different contexts, in the different products, whatever product you go with. So my research today really is, I think what's going on in the market, microservices, containers, event architectures, reactive systems. I'm always looking in the future, so don't worry if you haven't got this on your CV yet. And I look at these and see how APM products <laughs> products solve that today and where they're, they're adequate. And then I look at what my areas of expertise are in observability, controllability, and I'll get to what that means in operability. And operability is how we actually operate the tools. How we actually, it's a bit like cybernetics in second order, where in cybernetics we talk about an observer put into a system, and then in second order cybernetics is where the observer is aware that he that he or she within the system is impacting the system. And that's where we get to operability, is how do we actually know what we're doing in terms of monitoring? Is it effective? My talk will be past, a little bit of the past, present, a little bit of that and more on the future. And it'll be above in the clouds, but there's no clouds today because it's sunny. <laughs> I want to just tell you before how Instana got, because I'm actually the fifth beetle in Instana. When Instana formed, it was in 2014, and they ha were helping many other, app you know, other products. And the founders decided they needed a new APM product on the market, that these products were uh, uh, up to the... Yeah. And they asked me, I came in on board at the beginning, in 2014, and they asked me, he said, William, what do you think the future looks like in an APM? And I had to, we all had to have a meeting, and, and I brought this along. This is the original picture I sent to them. I said, this is my contribution to the company that was just being formed in Insana. And I said, what we need to do is, we need to be, humans are about ca ca gathering stories. I'm Irish, by the way, and Irish people are notorious for just collecting stories. In fact, I think that's all we do in life, is just collect stories, uh, events. And we're good at retelling them, and I think that's an important human nature. And when we come to systems to describe them, we need to think about narrative. What is it? How do we describe systems to others and to humans? So I said, well, what we need to do is think like Philips. We need a memory. A software needs to be able to recall itself, to remember that experience. It's never the same when you look at a chart or a dashboard or a log record. You can't see the system. Where it's like someone looked at commando and just said, someone got killed, someone got killed, someone got killed. And you can't see actually what that was happening in the movie. And I said, we have to be able to recreate software. Software has to be able to live again in, in a memory. 
So I said, if we take films, today this is on the, well, you can't see it today, so I drew out what films are basically made of, changes, behavior, states, scenes, actors, and I said, if we look at that in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of applications, we talk about events, activities, constitute the event, like if you're thinking of event as a start and stop, so you have two events that map to an, an activity. Activities are performed by actors. Now, what, how do you define an actor? Of course, it could be a microservice, it could be a component, but there are actors in these systems. And then there's the environment that they exist in, the process, the containers, things that impact them. And then time, of course, is running by, which is the scene, we want to know where time is going. And then all applications have phases. Applications are starting up, they're shutting down, they're restarting, they're running, hopefully for a lot longer than those th other things. And then there are segments in there, are very interesting segments about the software. The rest of it is it's probably boring stuff that's no novelty, but there are parts where we say, that's interesting, and the rest of it I really don't want to look at. And so I said, that's what we have to look at. We have to figure out the segments, capture snapshots, photos from a movie. That's what we do, we have these memes on the internet. Humans are already congesting, you know, we take a digesting movies into the favorite, favorite scenes when we want to communicate. And it's a great way of communicating and recording. So that was the inception. And, I, I, and then, of course, they had questions. <laughs> and I said to them, okay, well, here, how, how about if we look at the way logging is today? Logging, to me, was more like I'm making a journal. It was a way of synchronizing my thoughts, taking something out, putting it in a book, and saying there is something written down. And then application monitoring came along and people said, hey, now we can see the application. It was closer to the application. You know, things were, there was traces, and we had like instrumentation and measurement. It was different than logging. Logging is like someone makes a statement that something happened, but it is not the application. The application logs, but everything else that the log is is a translation of what that is. And I said, well, application monitoring is more see me, really see me in behavior. And then the industry went in to know me. Well, of course, we all want to be, of course, once you have some measurement, you want to be, what is it that's this I'm seeing? And so where we got in the industry is kind of software analytics. And where I went off in, in, in my research, I, I'd left and stand. I, well, in the inception, unfortunately, I got a, a bit of a health problem, and I had to leave. Uh, but I came back five years later, just joined back now. And, uh, but I wasn't five years sick. But I had a period of time where I was sick, and I had to leave. But, I continued on with my uh, vision, and it was about self-adaptive systems, system dynamics, feedback controls, and then mirrored simulation. A mirrored simulation is basically matrix for machines. I wanted to create the ability for all software to be able to project itself over into another universe, another machine universe. And the reason I did that is because if you look at gaming, gaming is about you take your human, you know, your, this person could just press away at things, and they're able to get these superpowers in a game. And I thought about what if we could extend or augment software by having it project itself over into another machine that says, I can re-execute you, and this time I'll augment you with something else. And that was what I went to do. <coughs> Unfortunately, when I presented it to Google, and they thought I was crazy, I realized I had no market. Because <laughs> if Google's not buying your stuff, no one's buying it. <laughs> so. So the other thing then is when we were doing, it, we're talking at all about that, is that the API market looked about like there was database tables and, and charts. This is basically what all APM products were around that time. It, someone had dumped some data into a database or tables to define it. People did queries against, and we charted it. This is basically Kanbana and you know, uh, 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 well, uh, sorry, uh, Grafana. We should talk about and 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 uh, Graphite. So. My view was that sensors are out in the system, there are agents collecting data, there are uh, discovering systems, they're sensing them, they're building up entity systems, and from that we define phases. We're looking for the dynamics of the system, we're not looking for charts, we're looking for what <coughs> is it that this software does, and why does it do it in a way that I can recognize regularity? What is the pattern, not just the statement? So we, you know, to do that, you, of course, you have to have collections, you have channels, agents are sending data along, and they're sending changes, and we're looking for these uh, things that happen. Now, my view of obser observability is really there are two ways it's going. Is there, one is more on the operational effectiveness, DevOps human way. So we're branching off where we started with logging, people went metrics and distributed tracing. 
And basically, we're either going to go, well, we're going to probably go two ways, because what we want to do is, the developers want nearly reconstruction of software. It's like a deep burger that can be done in production. So we're looking for more fine granularity, and we're going to be looking, something that's probably going to be done more by machine, but focus on developers. And even finer than we have, tracing today is at the edge because people couldn't figure out how to scale it when they put it in its code. But I think we can solve this problem. And then I think at the other end, the problem is that this data, the finer is, the more data that we get, it's not really geared towards humans, at least not what humans are meant to do, which is look for patterns, is to look at, extract reason about the data. And this is not really, I mean, machines, of course, will learn something, but it's the other thing that, the insights that we need. And I feel that humans are looking for a different model. They're looking for a model that's more driven about what is effective and what's more humane to me. I am not a machine and I don't want to start typing in, searching for things when I don't even know what I'm searching for. The problem with search-based tools is you have to already know something. How do you figure out what the problem is if, if you can't? So what I decided is that we needed, I went off and researched how animals, how language formed, because I felt that that was the understanding. If I wanted to make something that machines could understand, I need to understand how we develop language. And I went off and I started studying signaling behavior, how animals signal to each other. And I realized that's actually what we were probably trying to do with microservices. Services are becoming agents and they're communicating to each other. But today we're sending just text that's really, you know, more driven around the, the you know, the logging and tracing, but not a signal. Like hundreds of fields, but not one of them tells me, what does it mean? What is the signal? How am I meant to interpret this? And so I said, we have to solve that. So I decided we have to not think, not think about logging and metrics and, and of tracing as observability. I see them more as models. So really, <coughs> if we abstract a bit out, observability is about measure something in whatever way you want. Take, turn that into a model. A model is I make it a log. A model is I turn it into a metric. A model is I turn it into a trace. Or a model is I turn it into a signal. And then from that model, as the model changes, we have a memory of that model. And that's where we should be focusing on, is not thinking about these. These were there before when there was constraints. We have a different system, we have microservices. We need to think about there's a collective intelligence that we need to capture. So, what do we need? So measurement, the problem with measurement is the more measure, measurement you have, the higher overhead. But, and overhead goes up and accuracy goes down because you perturb the system. Model. A model is, of course, the, the kind of thing that you do with the measurement that you've made. And there, of course, the more, the bigger the model that you get, like tracing, or you want to create, collect 100 fields or 200 fields, the problem is your attention dwindles because you don't, you can't focus on everything. So you need to figure out what should I be attending to. That's the problem. You create another problem at the back end. I'm going to send you thousands of uh, data points, but now you have to figure out which it is. And, and I think the people at the back end are struggling with that. Memory and storage. The more memory that you have of a system, of course, the storage increases. And the problem then is you don't know what's significant because you have so much memory. You have memory of everything and you can't then figure out what's, what is significant, what should I prioritize. I'm going to quick move on past this one. So, because I'm worse for my time. Uh, memory. So, if we think about memory, this is what human memory, so I, 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 as I said, I, do, I have more books probably about other matters, subject matters than actually IT. My wife doesn't actually think I do IT, I think she thinks I'm something else, I'm trying to be a doctor in other sciences. But what is it, memory? So life without memory would be impossible. And the reason is because we can't detect change. Change is important in our system. If we, I have memory feeds change, it feeds planning. Without memory, by the way, the human mind, you cannot plan the next day because memory is the core of that. They actually to create even a plan itself. So everything in life, we always are living in the present. This to most of, well, actually, we, have, we live in the present, but everything else we're talking about, even in monitoring, is really about the past. That's what we're always dealing with. And the most important thing for humans, at least when in, in our evolution, was remembering what was significant. And I think that's what happened, what's hap that's what I worry about observability today, is that we've lost sight of that. 
And I think maybe driven by the word observability and not what we were trying to do, because it feels like I just keep watching, but not figuring out what I should be watching and why I'm watching. So we're not asking the questions. Is it significant? We've lost sight of that. It's like, later on we're going to fi figure it out if it's significant. This is a quote from uh, Blade Runner, if anybody knows. And this is where the replica is. And memory was important for the, even the robots, because it allowed them to control, they're able to control their emotions by giving them a memory. So it's, it's, it's important for robots, or replicas. Uh, so what's memory? It's basically encoding something that you've observed, storing it, and then retrieving it. Now you'll notice on the arrow, there's an arrow pointing into store. Because when we recall, we actually write back memory. So you're, the more you remember something, the less accurate that memory will be, because you change memory. People think, so that's the difference between human memory and mind, uh, and the machine memory, is a machine doesn't alter its memory, unless you write back the database record. But human memory adapts its memory. And then what it does is, it does that for an important reason, and I, and I think this is also important for observability. It incorporates new things into the data. Now that's a flaw if you're going to court, of course, because the more information you get later, post the event, you will incorporate it into your rec recollection of the event. But it's important for machine learning because when we remember and we bring in new information that we have, it gives it riches, enriches the, day, the memory itself and enables us to reason more about it. And of course, infer more about past memories. So what would be great is it that we could store memory separate from whatever else we're doing, and then every time we have a new technology or a new way of visualizing it, we replay the memory and, and let the machine appear again in a different way. Memory is broken up into sensory short-term, this is basically what we see, and the long-term, this is what we think in terms of APM. Observability is really about uh, the long-term. But it actually happens, sensory does happen in the agents. Agents, in Sana's agent has sensory memory. It has short-term memory. It decides whether something is interesting, whether to discard it or not. So we've built the pipeline in and stand it to be very much like this. They have sensory data memory, short-term, whether it was interesting, whether we should discard it, move it over into the long-term, which is where we move it to the cloud or to our data store. And then, of course, we're capturing th different types of memory. We're capturing, well, at least these two, in terms of explicit, episodic memory, Episodic memory is an event, is memory of something you've done in a period of time, like you know the date, what did I do yesterday? That's where you go and you remember what concert that you went to on a certain day. Semantic memory is knowledge of the system, is knowledge of facts, uh, of objects and things, colors. And semantic memory, of course, comes into operations because we want to discover entities within our system. And entities, of course, have things happening, and that's the events, and there are two and generally what happens with human memory is memory goes into the episodic memory because we're remembering an event. We take that, we relive it a little bit sometimes even in the short-term memory, switches between short. And then that episodic memory becomes a, a, a semantic memory because we extract something from it. So the question then is, should we remember everything? So that was the title of it, memory of everything. Should we? And I think when we do memory of everything, it means that we're failing to create the semantics. We're failing to do it. I think when we just have big data pipelines, that means we're failing to engineer, extract out what it means, what that information is, to create models that reflect that. So the more we go down the episodic, the less intelligent we really are. And it actually comes down to, the, when we think about memory, we think about recollection or recall, but there are actually two things that will go on there. There's the recollection of an event, which is where you're giving some, think about in terms of searching, someone gives you a label. Do you remember Thursday? Do you remember that event or some concert that you went to? And that triggers a search. That's called recollection. And recollection is really about getting a specific event. So you think about in standard, that would be traces. Recognition is suggestive. It says, this is similar to something else. This really is this other thing. And that's where I think we're moving to more. And Google has actually done that. Google used to be more of a search tool, and now it comes into more suggestive tool, because that's where intelligence is. And, and recognition is saying that this is familiar to something else, and that's where we need to go. So in terms of memory, if you're looking in Sana, what would you, what would you classify that? 
What do you think that is? In terms of we go back to the memory model. This is not episodic. Would it be semantic mo model? Wouldn't it? A little bit. It's derived from episodic memory, but it's really configuring, identifying objects within the space. This is where we've extracted something from the event data and we've turned it into representations that existed at that moment in time. And this is information that, so this would be, you could call this basically semantic memory. A tr this is somewhat in, in between here where we have semantic memory, it's the identified services, and there are little dots going along because we indicate we have events that say that they communicate. And of course, metrics are basically taking the events, the episodic memory, the uh, things that are happening, and then charting other types of information on top of that, building models up, and metrics is the thing. So we can build metrics from memories themselves. And there, there's more of an event, so you take an event and someone says what was happening. So the, what, that is basically an event system, an episodic memory. You're saying I want to remember that. Now the problem is that if you keep remembering all the details, you can't abstract out, let's say, that it's a, for some people who have this uh, autobiographical memory, it's very actually hard for them to plan other things around it because they're very detailed on memories, but they can't abstract out what it is the memory is about. And that's where we have to, when we look at systems, we have to say, is what is this representing? And I think that's where, where, where we need to move forward in. So why do we do observability? What are we trying to do with it? Observability really, and, and I think someone had already mentioned it, it came from control theory, which is cybernetics there, but observability was about control. We wanted to observe something, see what it is, does it meet to some set point, some goal, and then adjust something. So normally we perceive something, there's an attention to it, and then we create an action to adjust it. And let's say it's not, it's not performing to what we want. So really, observability is, not, is really controllability, but who's doing control today? Human, human intervention. There is no machines that we're doing really control. Control could be you restarting a system. So, and we had this thought also about observability versus monitoring. Observability and monitoring are really, monitoring is the process of observability. It's the process that tells observability what to do, what to observe, how to attend to something. And then also looks at what observability is and says, is this significant? It's not something that's smaller. Ob monitoring is, I mean, you could say APM products maybe are different, but observability is saying, how to define my strategy of observability? And observability feeds into monitoring. Monitoring then feeds back into it to tell it what to watch. And controllability, monitoring says, well, I want to control the system, I want to change my environment, or I have to react to something observed. So monitoring is that way of putting in force in controllability. If you haven't got control, then you're just passively watching your systems burn. Controllability, okay, who manages controllability? Observability and controllability are tactical. They're very like someone has to do something. Management have to dictate what is controllability. Do you have control of your systems today? So management decides, do we have the degree of controllability that we have? Is it human or is it automated? That defines the strategy. Now when we come down to monitoring, Monitoring really, at the basic, at least in terms of human and animal uh, evolution, is about looking at objects, looking for signaling behavior, and then inferring the state. Like if I go, Aah! it's very easy for another animal to think that, hey, he's gonna kill me, he's a bit angry. And that's actually what humans do. We, we send signals, and it's much better than saying, I, I would like to write a note to you that says I'm very angry. Well, what you do? No, you send a signal and it's very direct. People don't even have to read the message. So, signaling is something we forgot in our systems. We forgot to just tell people what it is. It's like, I'm going to write a very long log message, and there are a few words, and somehow, someone later on is going to do machine learning magically and extract that that, that meant, it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. So, we're missing that. And I think that's, that's what Instan is working on in the future, is coming out with new ways of signaling, a new language, a new way of saying, what is it you're trying to say to me? Stop sending me data, send me the information, send me the signal, and I can do it. Because we see that microservices are like a collective system of ser service, uh, agents, services. And, we, and by the way, we don't think it's just one guy tells us, we think everybody gets to vote on each other. 
The way Insan is building our new systems is all services will vote on all the other service whether he thinks he looks good to him, to him or not. And that's important because every other service has different sensitivities. So we have very resilient systems and then we have other systems that are not resilient. So what do you do then? Like I can fail for one service, but for another service I can't fail because he hasn't got resilience for J or something else. So he needs to be more sensitive to my errors than the other guy. The other guy can recover. So nowadays we can't say to the service, before we used to say to the service, like as in a, a you know, uptime or a probe, hey, are you okay? And, and he would go, yeah, or oh, bad, good, bad, or ugly. Today we need to ask everybody, or everybody that's connected, all services, does this guy look good to you? And of course, how do you define what that look good? And that's where we're coming out. We're coming out with ways of defining what that signal, what shapes that that person's making on the dance floor that says which mood he's in. And we're coming out where we're trying to be more focused on the significance and less on the, the sent, bring that sensory information up there and figure out, what well, is it significant? And do it at the source rather than do it at the back end because that doesn't scale. If you get engineers, developers building lots of metrics, there are some poor DevOps guy who's gonna have to look at all of these weirdly named metrics and figure out which one of those am I meant to be looking at? And what are they trying to tell me? I mean, you might recognize there's a count on it and there's a queue, but then you're figuring out, is this really important? Is this the one I should look at? And the developer feels good because I've made everything observable, but you've overloaded the guy and the guy at the other end is not the one that defines the rules and the alerts. So we think that what's missing is we start with what this signal is. We tell people you've only got 15 signals to send. You pick which one it is, the signals become something of an assessment. We map that to a state. And we get rid of all of the other data because really what we want is signal, not the message. It doesn't mean that, that just a, it's not needed, but for people or for even machines to learn, we need them to be more like humans and signal. And so we think then that in, in terms of scaling it out, we're going to have many agents or many services where the memory, the measurement, the model are all stacked on top of each other. Because you have collectives, you have groups like organizational systems where within this cluster, this type of behavior is okay. Within this other triangle here, this cluster here, these services operate differently. So, and I'm probably, oh, am I okay for time? A little bit? Yeah. Okay, good. I'll just take it. Sorry? Okay, so today where we are, uh, we're doing tracing and logs, and we have metrics. And I think they're important. I'm not discounting all of that, but I'm talking about the effectiveness of what it means to be monitoring a system. I, and I, 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 it took me a while to learn this, because when I left in Stana, I decided, okay, I've been building products at that stage for 15 years. And I said, I'm going to go up and work in the industry itself and monitor systems and you know, use tools, other people's tools. Because I've been building my own tools and everybody says, you're building tools just for yourself. And I said, okay, I'm gonna find out what everybody else is doing that I think doesn't, you know, like, because I'm building something that's you know, impossible. At least impossible for them to understand. So I, I start working for banks. And I remember going into mission control centers and looking up at the dashboard and I seen all of these charts and I said to the guy, Am I meant to look, what am I meant to do with that charge? Like, how will I know that's good or bad? And the guy said to me, because it looked all jaggedy. It looked very pretty. And it was like, shh. And I said, does that spike look bad or good? You know, I was curious because I, I've been building profiling tools, lots of event collections, creating simulations of machines. And then I lost sight that people have to look at all of that data I was collecting. And I looked at the chart and looked at the spikes. And the guy said to me, he said, when it flatlines, then we're in trouble. <laughs> and, and, and he says, when it doesn't, when there's no more, when it's regular, we're in trouble. Because everything is irregular on that chart. Because the only time it was ever irregular, it was a straight line. When nothing is happening, that's start panicking. So all of the other time I was like looking at those jagged lines and I was like, it's art. We're just creating art. 
We're creating nice print pictures. No one knows anymore what we're doing. It's chaos. <laughs> and, I, and I said to myself, well, you know, the, the director of the bank said to me, William, I want you to help us be more effective because I don't want, we, at this time, but they had engineers who were actually jumping in. They kept calling in the developers who wrote the system and said, help us figure out what that means. Help them because I needed to give it to normal people. People, not, you know, other people who didn't build that code, who didn't write it, who doesn't know that that thing I wrote, that little metric, that means that. And I said, okay, first of all, I said, let's standardize on names. That was my initial gut reaction, like, let's have a catalog, because everybody catalogs things. At least then I know. And then I figured out that everybody, there was no way to ever get anybody to conform to different, everybody had a different way of explaining things. And then everybody had a different chart. They said they had thousands of charts, and people were spending more time trying to figure out which chart they should be looking at. I, I remember like the first five minutes of all incidents in this bank was get in and start searching for that chart. Oh, it's not that chart, it's the other one. No, that one wasn't updated anymore. We would spend more time like, and I was like, oh, okay, one day we're gonna figure out, bookmark that one. And then someone of course would go in and edit it and then it would be useless next time. And I, I said, okay, we can't just standardize the metrics. We need to standardize on what it is that the metrics represent. What is it that I need to know a few words that tell me whether I should react. And so I decided signals was the solution, that we had to come up with common language that signals something. Signal retry, signal timeout. Don't give me a long string and I have to look in there. Signal that you're falling back to something. Like I don't care whether it's a cache, but I need to know that you're in degraded mode. I need to know that you're in uh, your, your defective mode. I need to know that, and I can only know that from the set of signals. Are you making calls? Are you proceeding? Are you working? Is it okay? So, and you know what? We've already done this out there in the world. It's called HTTP codes has error codes to indicate. But the problem is that we haven't come up with a universal one that extends beyond just HTTP, beyond those er error codes. I mean, they map a little bit, but we don't, and the, the thing is, so far today, is more resilient. Before when there was a black and white, you're either up and down. Today is like you're kind of degraded. So it's a gray area. You're defective, but you're still wo working. You know, that part of your service is okay. The other part is still working. So we have REST services. The put is failing, but the get is working because the cache is there. How do you know that anymore? We don't know it because we have no language anymore. We, we, someone had to know that there's a metric somewhere named this way depending on which team it is, what they call the translator. So you will, we'll actually create, have to create a tool that translates for everything. Like, you pick that, map it to this, that's our signal. And you know what, we kind of do that today, it's called alerts. And, no one, and everybody that tr tries to do that, they start off very positive and go up to create the ultimate alert system. I got to map every rules and, uh, and then they get into it and they realize the developers are changing it just as quick as they can figure out the rules that have to be, and then they just give up because change is happening, everything is happening quickly, you don't even know if it's gonna be worth doing. So we need another way of something that stays beyond the message, something that's not just a string, something that's not a book, something that just flashes, icons, things that, and then what do we have in, in social engineering today? Emojis, you can send a whole text to just one little token that says, that's it. You know when something's burning, because it's a flame. And that's what we haven't got today. What have we got? We've got, a we've got a big long string somewhere, or a metric or something, and someone has to go, is that a flame? I don't know, it depends. If there was a flame before, it's even worse. <laughs> and that's the thing, so what we need is sequencing. We need, little, we need to go back to building symbolic language, and we need sequencing on that. And then we can recognize, because that's what humans are great at. It's hard scanning when you're under pressure. Like, I need to read this text very quickly. Just give me the flame. Is it good or is it bad? Like, oh, I'm coming back up. Is everything good? And that's where we need to go. And I think that's where humans need to work. And why is that important? Because signals and states are effective. They're suggestive. It's easy to do detection with them. And there's, it's, prediction is very easy with them. And they're relevant. And of course, because it's a signal, it should be significant. You don't tell people, oh, meow, meow. You don't do that, you signal significance. Metrics are still there. I think what we'll have is signals will eventually turn into, they will generate metrics themselves. Because people will want to know, how many fires did you send yesterday? 
there's where it's good. That's where it's good because you can have a metric on a signal, not a metric that is kind of a signal. So I think we're, we're, we will have these other things, but they're going to be fed a different way. We have to go downwards rather than bottom up. At least that's my vision. You don't have to agree with it, but you can't, you, you, someone asked me for my opinion and that's where I think we're going. Their metrics are efficient, they're good for shifts in data, you know, time phases. They're good for dashboards, we need that still. And they're in the present and they're relatable. You can relate one metric to another. I mean, you could relate another se sequence of symbols, but if you could count them, you could probably see that he did that amount of that signal and this amount of signal, they look similar. And that's where metrics are good at comparing. And of course, what where it happens with signals is that signals tell tracing and logging what it means, it gives it an extra context and it turns it on. We don't have to have it on until the signal is there. I signal something and then we start watching much more carefully. And then we go back, we retrospect. So this is the, what we need. We need the fingerprint on emojis. I said it, that's the future. Emoji, of observability is emojis. <laughs> now, can you help me? Yes. If I have got... Three minutes, but well, maybe. So you want to show us a video? But I. Yeah, hopefully. But I don't want the. Uh, uh, okay. So um, how do I control this? I know Windows user. Okay. Yeah, I think so. So, uh, I didn't know we couldn't do a demo today, so luckily I had pre-recorded a video before a long time ago, I think a few years ago, about... Um, so, up to now I've been talking about signals, it's very good, important for operations. I think it, it, it decides on what we should attend to, and then we drill down. So, we go from signals to metrics to traces. That's what I figure that we, we need. Now, I'm not discounting data, because I love data, I love actually the machine. I love to see machines execute again. My view is like Tron, legacy. I just want to go in there and let those bikers go by me. And uh, I want to visualize it in a virtual reality. I want to see threads just flowing by and experience it. And, and so I do love data. Signals is important for operations. It tells me what I need to do, what I need to attend to. But, I need, but when I get there, I want something more immersive. And I wanted to show you something that I... So what I did is in this video, is I created a memory of Kafka. So I ran Kafka, uh, I instrumented Kafka, and I ran, Kafka is a, you know, you know, it was a log system. And I had it do a benchmark, it created all, lots of code was executed, and I recorded that code, that memory of the machine in this special uh, memory language. And then I'm able to replay that memory back. Now I'm going to initial, I'm gonna jump in the video because I, I'm, is this playing? Hopefully it's not going to be... I'm going to try to jump to where I need to... Okay. So, let me see where... Is this playing back to memory? Okay. Yeah, so I think this is doing the application. So this is the part where I'm really building the application. I'm connected to the application. The application is doing the benchmark. You can see there. This is a profiling tool connected to a JVM. And this is the application. This is Kafka. Yeah? And this is the, the, the profiling tool watching Kafka. Okay, so this is real, reality. But it's on the video there. Now, during that, a memory is created. So, I'm gonna see. Yeah, and you can see up there that there's a memory file called benchmark stenos. And that's a memory, it's 645 megs. So it's quite big because the thing was running for a while. And, and then I want to be able to replay it again. So this is me restarting the memory of the system. And Kafka is reborn. It recreates the whole JVM of Kafka. And this is not Kafka running. If we go back to the, the window, there is no logging that Kafka is doing stuff. This is to the profiler, he thinks Java is running again. The JVM is recreated. And what's that doing? It's giving JVM a new lease of life. We can see it again. 
and it looks real. And we can even use a tool like we're connected. I can pick on a method, this is a method in Kafka, and I can watch it at this moment firing within the JVM. The JVM is re-executing all of the code again. The first time I showed this demo, someone said to me, does that mean the database transactions are going to be done again? No. It, it's, the way to think about it is like someone cleaning a window on a street, a mimic, a mime artist, where he's cleaning the window. All the JVM is doing is mimicking. I'm going in and popping and, and pushing frames on a stack. Threads are recreated, but there's no code. And, but it creates the observability. It says, hey, I'm going into method such and such, and it sends, it sends a memory again to the profile. And the profiler says, he's executing the code. But of course, the code block is empty. The system is running a simulation of the code, and it's running it to the exact way it was run. And why is that important? Because you know, well, I could have, you know, when we look at profiling tools, a lot of the time we're running something, we get a snapshot, and we can't actually go back to, oh, there was something interesting in the timeline. If you have charting, you might see it, but this is dynamic. I can run it up again and again. And so, but what's good about it, like? Well, what's good is that you can invent a new way of seeing a system. So I'm going to this is you can actually recreate snapshots. But what's more interesting, I'm going to jump ahead to it, is where we tell the memory when you're replaying. I'm going to activate here. Um, uh, I'm doing something. I will do something else. I don't, that's just changing something where I want to focus on a part of the memory, and then I'll see it. Okay, let me go to this one. It's a while since I've seen this demo, so I have to think about it. Okay. Jump ahead. In this case here, the memory said I, I replayed the memory and I wanted to get a stack, a thread stack, and I wanted to focus it on a particular thread with a particular entry here. So I told the memory to replay, and I said, just watch where we, I enter into this method. And that means I have a smaller uh, snapshot itself. But we can go better than that. Because what we can do is, let's see if I'm doing it now. Come on, William. Type quicker. OK, so we're getting to the fun part. OK, the matrix. So I've activated an extension that's going to replay the simulation again. But it's going to replay it with an extension I created a visualization called the matrix. So recreate the whole JVM. And this could all be your code instrumented. And it's going to play that JVM code again, reimagine the code running again, but it's going to replay it with a matrix viewer. Do you see that? These columns there are threads running in the JVM. That was the stack frames that were pushing. It's a frame that says, I want to create, I want to create a matrix. Why was it very quick? The reason it was very quick is because in the replay, I can tell it to slow down or fast speed up. And in this case, I can replay a whole memory system. And I think in the next part, I get it to slow down. I think this is me slowing it down there. I'm turning on a time sync. And now you'll see when the replay starts up, these, each column there represents a thread. And the dot represents a frame. And you'll see now this is Kafka starting up. And now it's going to start loading. And you'll see now where those, the, the whiteness is indicating it was active in the last second, that this thread was active. And we'll start to see something happening now. And there's the inserts. And you can see them. So what is it that we can do with memories? Well, we can create new ways of seeing systems. Another one I'm going to show you uh, is this system. Here's another visualization of the same memory. And here I watch, I, I look at Kafka, and every 15 seconds it resets it, but this tells me what's happening on the count. Uh, you can't see the numbers that are hidden by the column, but there is actually telling me the activity that's being performed. So this is the time spent in this code at the moment, and then we reset, and every 15 seconds you see them all go back up. Each of these is a probe, is a method within Kafka. So that's another way of seeing code. Here's another visualization, stacked frames going up and down. And you can watch them uh, things. And probably another one, one more. The, per the point of the, this is another one where you take snapshots. The point of this is that with one memory recording, I can play it back in different ways to see it. And it's not tied to what I do today. If in the future, 
I create a new technology, a new way of visualizing, like VR or augmented reality or something like that, I could actually connect up the memory and go into it. So my view is that I'm archiving all of these memories of Kafka and all of these systems that perform, and one day someone's going to say, I would like to see what Kafka was doing, how it performed, how it's dynamics, and we will jump in and see code fly by. We will experience code execution. Because that's not log, that's not tracing, that's not a metric. I mean, it's a visualization. That's the beginning of us finally getting to see what code looks like at least to a human for understanding purposes, to extract out the dynamics. And that's where I hope one day I'm standing will be. Okay, cheers.